you know we're live. No, I'll let you know. We're live. Good morning. This is the House Judiciary Committee, and there is a voting session here on March the 19th, 2021. We're going to start this morning with House Bill 71. We are uh, primary. Wait, are we primary? We're we're primary. We're primary to. Uh, oh, we're secondary to Ways and Means. That's right. We're primary. No, we are primary. Let's just take a look at the bill. Yes, um, we are in fact primary. Um, Ways and Means made a number of amendments to this bill last night. It has to do with the Juvenile Services Education Board. It seeks to set up a school board specific to the education system within the Department of Juvenile Services. Um, this, uh, Lauren, can you talk about what the amendments that Ways and Means did and, and yes. uh, what they've sent to us? Yes, so the Ways and Means Subcommittee, which handled this bill, adopted the Judiciary Committee amendments, but in addition, they adopted a number of additional amendments shown on the reprint. Um, so starting, starting on page three of the reprint, Dylan, the amendments require the these expert review teams, which were established under the blueprint for Maryland's future, to have visited all residential facilities um, in which juveniles are educated by the end of the 2025 to 2026 school year. The amendments also provide that the Juvenile Services Education Board is an independent unit within DJS. Uh, the amendments require members of the board to reflect the diversity of the population of juveniles in the state specify qualifications for the Juvenile Services Education Program Superintendent, make, this, make the superintendent rather than DJS responsible for implementing educational programs, require DJS to notify a juvenile in custody of the juvenile's education, educational rights, specify the content of the superintendent's annual report, and the report must be disaggregated by student demographic characteristics. Um, additionally, the amendments specify timeframes for audits of the board and require DJS to contract with a public or private entity to conduct an evaluation of its educational policies. And finally, the amendments provide that the provisions of the bill terminate on June 20th, 2033, so 12 years. Move the amendments. There's a motion to move the amendments. Is there a second? Second. second. Moved and seconded. Is there further discussion on the amendments? Oops, if I have that up. Seeing no further discussion about the amendments, all in favor, please raise your hands. Atterbury Griffith, Lopez, Shetty Moon, Cam Jones, Williams, McComas, uh, Watson, Fisher, Malone, Grammer, Conaway, Crutchfield, Cardin, and Davis. Anybody opposed? Uh, I have a, I actually do have a question, um, but I can ask. A, we can okay. ask once they're adopted. And That's fine. The amendments are adopted. Now we'll go to the bill. Motion for, can we have a quick mo motion? Move favorable. Motion, motion for yeah. favorable and a second. We'll go to discussion and now Delegate Eric. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So um, could council just explain to me what the new process is going to be like? Because when I'm when I'm looking at it, it seems like it's a lot different than how it left our community now. So how, how does how does the board work and the superintendent work with DJS now? My understanding is these are not too different than what our the amendments judiciary passed um, were providing for some transfer of personnel, as you know, and some other tweaks. These are making some additional tweaks, but the main point, the main, um, the main change has not, ha the, the main point of the bill has really not changed, which is 
to um, move everything from the MSDE for the for the residential the, the edu sorry the education of children in residential facilities move that from MSDE to this juvenile services education board in DJS. So the additional tweaks are to sort of by, by ways and means are to make this board an independent unit and to have a, the superintendent, which was already in the bill, um, instead of DJS being responsible for administer, administering the educational programs. And then some additional you know, provisions that kind of are consistent with the blueprint. Okay, so then I mean, if the superintendent is now sort of autonomous completely and in charge of the budget, who is the, I mean, now I feel like it, DJS can just go out and buy what they need, you know what I mean? But now if they're not the ones in charge of that, it's still gonna be MDE who's super slow and not functional, who's in charge of the money. I'm not positive because these sort of, I can check with Ways and Means Council, but I don't see any change to the bill. From, there's no change to the bill regarding the funding issues or anything of that nature. The board is appointing the superintendent. So the superintendent is still, you know, part of the board. I don't know. I, I don't believe there's any change about funding mechanisms. That's still the bill that you, you know, the amendments that you adopted are still consistent with that, so. So, so I guess I thought, I thought that it was supposed to be the board was making the educational decisions and then DJS was implementing them with, with their own funding. That's what I thought was going to happen. And now if there's a superintendent that has the, the authority, do they have the authority over the DJS budget? How does that work? For the budget question, I can get back to you. I do not know the answer. I'm sorry. Yeah, because I mean, I, 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 I don't I don't like it if that's what happens, because then it just delays the ability for them to to do anything still, which was the whole point was that right now it's it's hard for them to get things done because they're waiting for MDE for a lot of stuff and that's not functional. So yeah, that's my that's my biggest concern. If, if that's what's happening on the on the money side, like that's that defeats the purpose of the bill, which was to make it streamlined and, and more effective. And not, that's not going to do that if, if the superintendent is now waiting, is now the one that's control or is controlling the money and TJS can't just buy what's needed when it's needed. You know, I, th I thought the point was that the, the board told them what educational things were going to be needed. That they would do that. Do you know what I mean? Let me reach out while we're talking. I, I can message. They are also voting on this as we speak, I believe. But let me message council and see if on, on ways and means see if I can get an answer. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Sure. sure. All right. Let's uh, let's do this. Let's give Lauren a chance to get the answer to that question from ways and means. So I'm so where that stands right now is is there is a motion for a favorable, a favorable with amendment. We're going to hold on to that just so that we can get the answer, but I don't want to completely stop the train here because we have some other things some other things to do but we'll give uh, Lauren the chance to do that and go to a bill that is not in her bailiwick so house bill 308 delegate uh, Rosenberg Cardin's bill regarding slap suits uh, yep appeared from the civil law subcommittee so go ahead delegate Cardin there are amendments okay thank you um so um, I think we're all pretty familiar with slap suits now. We do have um, some two, I think, relatively minor amendments <clears throat> that we put into the bill. The first is that we remove the word targeted you know, before discovery to allow for the judge has the discretion to allow for as much discovery as possible and it doesn't constrict him and give or her to say that he can only allow for some but rather, if he wants to have full discovery in the preliminary motions period, he can order that. The second amendment is to change how the, um, or to change the language and how the fee shifting will work. If a party, um, if a party prevails in a preliminary motion to dismiss, party um, has uh, shall be awarded. Um, if the if the prevailing party is the defendant, the defendant shall be awarded um, attorney's fees 
uh, as the um, in, and the, the amount is determined by the judge in what um, the judge believes is a proper and just. Um, and we can read the exact language if you want. Um, uh, Holly, why don't we, or Dylan, why don't we move down to the, towards the bottom, the very bottom. So the amendment is here. Here. Uh, thank you. Um, grants the anti-slap motion. The court shall award reasonable attorney's fees and costs to the moving party, but only if the court determines that justice and equity require it. If the court finds that the motion to dismiss is frivolous or solely intended to cause unnecessary delay, the court may award reasonable attorney's fees and costs to the responding party. So basically, um, this was actually language taken out of the slap suit in Oklahoma, but we looked at all the slap suits from all the slap suit statutes from all 27 other states that have them and um, the subcommittee chose this language. Move the amendments. There's a motion for the amendments. I see you delegate Eric and there's a motion for the amendments. Uh, is there a second? Second. Moved and seconded all in favor. Well, wait, we'll do discussion. Delegate Eric Ham. Thanks. So is there any way we could get that pulled back up there, Dylan, Dylan. so I can look at it? Um, is is the, the the equity piece there, is that a term of art that, that we're using, the justice and equity require it? Is that? So I that is, I mean, I believe that is a term. I mean, we use, so in every lawsuit that I file, I say an, an other, um, relief that the judge determines is just and equitable. That's basically a, a, a term that I, that I use at the end of every lawsuit when I make my claim for damages. Um, other trial lawyers can, can chime in if they want to. So it, what it does is it, it, for all intents and purposes, it gives, it makes the courts happy because they think that they have discretion, even though it requires the attorney's fees to be made shall award a uh, reasonable attorney's fees. It also gives the judge some degree of discretion to say, wait a minute, um, you know, you can't, you can't take $50,000, even though, you know, you're claiming that's reasonable. That's not reasonable. I think that what is just and equitable would be $15,000 or whatever it is. So I think that's kind of what, why that language is the way it is. If anybody else wants to chime in, I'm happy to hear from others. Yeah. Okay, so it's something that defense attorneys might use, but is it something that the court is familiar with? I mean, is well, that- I'll just speak here, Delegate. Um, it is in the code in other instances. So okay. I, yes, it, it's it's in other instances in other articles. Okay, and- It's, um, it's basically the court, giving the judge discretion, right? Yeah. Delegate Cardinals? The courts do do see this all the time, and they know what they know what it means. Okay. Yes, okay. It does I give the make courts sure. some discretion. Some discretion. We, we weren't leaving some some term that they'd get to re redefine. So that's good. Okay. So now, in in total, um, how does this amendment change it from the posture that it was the last time we saw it? What what does it? I, I don't think it really changes it very much. It just it it clarifies. In my opinion, it clarifies that. Um, that attorney's fees are required um, and shall be given to the, to essentially, or shall be given to the, to the moving party um, if they prevail. I mean, that's basically what it does. I think it clarifies the language. The original language in the bill was, um, you can look at the original language and see how it's been changed. It's not, it's not changed very much. So I would say it's almost technical. But and what was the vote in subcommittee on it? I think the vote was unanimous. Okay. On the amendments yeah. or the whole bill? Both. Uh, well, okay. wait, no, no, no. I think, uh, um, there, I think I think I, had, I, th I thought I voted against it. There was two, two people, two opposed. I'm sorry. There were two opposed. Okay. So, okay. I have four to, four to two. Four, four to two. Okay. okay. But I believe that the, the, the amendments were unanimous, that everybody agreed that the amendments made the bill better. Um, okay. 
Okay. You know, look at the original language. The original language is like much shorter, and this just makes it very clear as to what the that you know how the how the fees should be shifted. Okay. Thank thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Are there further questions on the amendments? Delegate Who's McComas. As amended. I, I think we already have a motion. Oh. Delegate McComas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was just going to ask the um, sponsor, uh, Delegate Cardin, if he would explain um, the, the type of circumstances that the, this bill is, is designed to protect. I tried to do that to Delegate Watson yesterday. So, uh, well, I, um, I'm not on your committee, so I'm sorry. <laughs> I understand. No, no. So, so I've already had practice. I'll try and do it quickly. So, um, so uh, a husband and wife um, have a development going up in their backyard with 56 brand new houses. And these guys are coming in and they're tearing up everything and they're going through the forest buffer and they're, and they're doing everything that they think they're not allowed to be doing. So they go and they go to the zoning commission and they, uh, and they start um, filing things and sending letters and doing all these um, things to try and stop the development from happening. The developer, a very wealthy, connected person, <clears throat> excuse me, files a lawsuit against this, in, this couple and basically both throws them into a, a financial nightmare and a total whirlwind of legal, um, legal battles that they have no idea what they're getting themselves into. Not only go bankrupt, but also causes them to um, to uh, to take up all their time and all their energy, so that they can't pursue what they believe is justice, nor can they pursue their regular daily lives. So they then so and they file. He files a lawsuit against them, and the sole purpose of his lawsuit that he's filing against them is just to get them to stop doing what they're doing, which is delaying his development. So they then file a motion to dismiss based on SLAP. This is unfair. This is a violation of their free speech that they have every right to do what they're doing. And it's in public interest. Um, and it's in front of a, and or it's in front of a state or local agency. And there was no reason why he should be allowed to file a lawsuit that stops them from doing what they think they're rightfully allowed to do. So if they win that lawsuit, if they, excuse me, if they win that motion to dismiss, then the judge will grant their, their attorney's fees and costs um, have to be paid by the plaintiff. Mm -hmm. And if the um, motion to dismiss is determined to be frivolous or inappropriate or wrong or simply just to harass the plaintiff, the judge can shift the fees, excuse me, for uh, the motion, the costs and the fees of that motion that were born on the plaintiff, um, he can shift that onto the defendant. So it can go either way. Move the previous question. All right, there's a motion for the previous question. All in favor say aye. 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 Uh, any opposed? Aye. Seeing none, we're moving the previous question. The question was on the amendment. All in favor of the amendment, please raise your hands. Delegates Atterbury, Lopez, Shetty, Moon, Jones, Williams, McComas, Watson, Malone, Grammer, uh, Deborah Davis, Crutchfield, Fisher, Conaway, Bartlett, Cardin, Erican. Anyone opposed? Seeing none. I support the amendments. I'm sorry. We're on sure. the bill as amended. I'm sorry, Delegate Griffith. I had my hand up to support that. Okay, Griffith is a, is for the amendment. Any. Further favorable motion on the bill. There's motion for favorable on the bill. Is second. There second. Moved and seconded. Chair, I just want to say one thing. I in, in the amendment, I left out one instance where targeted needs to be striked. It's a technical error. So just if anybody's looking and, and notices in, in paragraph three, Delegate Cardin mentioned the target discovery is going to be removed. And I have missed one instance there. So it's a minor technical change, but just in case anybody's wondering, um, I wanted to put that out there. All right. Move the amendment. Uh, we will take that oral amendment from council. All in favor of that oral technical amendment, say aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? Aye. 
Seeing none, that, that technical amendment is adopted. Now, again, on the bill as amended, we'll take it. It's still as a favorable as amended because that was a technical. Um, any further discussion? Move the bill, Mr. Chair. I think, I think we did. Seeing none, I think we did. All right. Favorable as amended, the roll call. The vice chair? Yes. Delegate Eric Han? No. Delegate Bartlett? Yes. Delegate Cardin? Yes. Delegate Conaway? Yes. Delegate Cox? Is he here? Okay. Uh, Delegate Crutchfield? Yes. Delegate Davis? Yes. Delegate Wanika Fisher? Yes. Delegate Grammer? No. Delegate Griffith? No. Delegate Rachel Jones? Yes. Delegate Lopez? Yes. Delegate Malone? No. Delegate McComas? Yes. Delegate Moon? Yes. Delegate Shetty? Yes. Delegate Cham? No. Delegate Ron Watson? Yes. Delegate Williams? Yes. See, 14 to 5. Motion for a favorable passes. We're going to go now to House Bill 316. House Bill 316, we heard some time ago. There's a question related to funding that I believe we have addressed. Um, if we could put the amendments on the screen, I'm going to walk the committee through uh, what we're doing here. Um, the issue here is on the, the cost of pre-trial release home detention um, monitoring. So again, this is not after sentencing. This is before sentencing. This is before trial. Um, what the bill did as originally drafted and, and still does is it says that the state shall pay for private home um, for high, private home detention um, shall pay the fees for this. Different counties have different procedures for this. Some charge fees, some do not. Um, and DPSCS generally does not charge fees in the city of, uh, of Baltimore for its service, but there are private companies that operate as well. Baltimore County just recently uh, changed their system where they do not charge fees, but the idea being that at this point, while we're still in the pandemic, we wanna make sure that people are not being detained um, inside lockdown facilities if we can, and that if we can get them private home detention, we should, but we also shouldn't allow um, cost to be an issue if they're found to be indigent. So what the bill does um, is it takes, um, five million dollars uh, for the next fiscal year, and it dedicates it to uh, home detention, uh, to to paying for private home detention. The bill would set up would it uh, this bill would only be effective during the the catastrophic health emergency, and for one year afterwards. And furthermore, it would set up a work group of, of people, including the Office of the Public Defender, the state's attorney, um, the Job Opportunities Task Force, the uh, Secretary of Public Safety and Correctional Services, three members of the Senate and the House, a representative of the chiefs, representative of a large local detention center, a small local detention center, um, and a couple representatives of pretrial release uh, programs. Um, to uh, sit down as a work group and make recommendations before the 2022 session to address this issue more broadly. The bill as it's drafted would have just gotten rid of fees altogether um, forever, which I, I understand the, the, the sponsor's intent. Um, I do think we have a situation right now where we need to address this issue quickly. So uh, allowing or, or uh, paying for those uh, pre-trial home detention fees now um, makes some sense. 
but uh, going forward, there there needs to be, um, I think, more discussion on this. Move to so adopt the amendment. Go to some, uh, so we'll go to the, uh, there's a motion on the amendments. Is there a second? We have hand raised. I, I know, but we're gonna- we, Second on the amendment. That's fine. We're not, we're now going to take discussion on the amendment and that can start with Delegate Conway. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, committee. So we're saying that Baltimore City is going to pay a private agency to do the pretrial release home monitoring? The state would pick up the cost for private home monitoring under this bill. The state would pick that cost up during the, the uh, catastrophic health emergency and for a year thereafter. Why, 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 isn't, why isn't the city uh, developing an agency that can do this? So the city's pretrial system is run by the Department of Public Service services. They have a certain number of slots that are available. Uh, there are further people who the court identifies are amenable to uh, home detention. And so this would seek to cover those people to make sure that, that they are able to do home detention as they wait for trial. One of the things specifically in Baltimore City that uh, has, has emerged, it's not really emerged recently, but has become more of an issue is that there are 3,500 cases in circuit court waiting for trial right now. Um, and the best that we can figure out the number of jury trials that they're going to be able to have, it's going to be relatively small to begin with. So the goal of not, um, I mean, again, while things have been getting better and while vaccines are out there, we still have an issue where we need to make sure that uh, we're not overcrowding in Baltimore City, the detention center, and then in other places across the state. That's that's why we would uh, seek to to pay for these private home detention fees. So, in other words, you're telling me that you don't think that Baltimore City could ramp up immediately to do Baltimore City does not do its own pretrial program. It's run by the Department of Public Safety and Correctional Services. Which is through the state. Which is through the state. Okay, thank you very much. All right, Delegate Grammer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Can somebody refresh me as to the fiscal note, please? As amended. $5 million. It's $5 million that would come from the, the uh, federal assistance that we're receiving, uh, that, uh, that we're receiving in the most recent stimulus package. Okay, thank you. Be in fiscal 22. Delegate Deborah Davis, then Delegate Cham. Mr. Chair, I just wanted to weigh in and just, I don't know, thank whoever worked on this bill because this is gonna make a huge difference in the lives of Marylanders and I'm just really excited about it. So just thank you. You're welcome. Delegate Cham, and I mean that seriously, it's been something that, we, that, that I've been working on. Um, and look, I, I, again, I think that, that there are, are, are some certainly larger issues that we could talk about about pretrial, but at least at this point, where we are right now, this makes sense. We need to make sure that there are not people who are being detained simply for an inability to pay for, the, for, for monitoring. Um, we need to make sure that we can keep them out of facilities and lower the risk of uh, potential infection as best we can at this point. Delegate Cham, then Delegate Eric. Thank you, Chairman. Is this for um, any persons who are uh, facing pretrial that have committed all, all types of crimes, or are they egregious crimes, or from misdemeanors to felonies? So what happens is there are a couple different couple different systems. The Department of Parole and Probation, or not Parole and Probation, because that's after the Department of Public Services, Public Safety. Take two, the Department of Public Safety and Correctional Services, DPSCS, has um, some regulations that limit the availability of home detention to people who are, um, who are uh, not charged with violent crimes and who within three years of, and uh, if they have committed a violent crime and they were on probation for the violent crime, 
they cannot receive home detention if they're on the back end of that. There are people who, who are, who the judge at the bail review will say, all right, I, after hearing from both sides, the state and the defense, I believe that that home detention is, is appropriate. Generally speaking, judges have in the past tended to be conservative with the, their use of, of home detention. Um, if they believe that it's a, if they know that it's a case that involves, uh, involves violence, um, they, they won't grant home detention in those cases. So effectively what's happening here is there are some slots that are already available and there are those regulations that, that limit it. This would say, okay, if a judge says that I believe that, that home detention is appropriate, then, then it, would, it would provide one way forward if the person was proven to be indigent. Delegate Eric Hamm. Hey, Rich. Thanks, Mr. Chair. So I, I know we mentioned that there was a $5 million that we we're getting from the Fed, but isn't this going to be a recurring cost and that federal money is not going to be recurring, right? It, it will last only one year longer than the end of the ca catastrophic health emergency. Now, so what that, what I, the way I see it, I don't know when the catastrophic health emergency is going to end, but I know two things. One, the funding in this bill only lasts in fiscal 22. So that will end on June 30th, 2022. Um, and I also know, look, I, I think we all hope that things continue to get better and that we, we, we see an end to the emergency. If the emergency is not over at the end, uh, you know, by the time we come back for the, for, for the 22 session, then we're gonna be able to take up this issue again and that's why there's a work group there who can identify what needs to happen next. So that's that's the argument is there's no funding beyond 22. Um, we and and again the 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 availability of the payments for the private home detention would just stop at uh, uh, after like I said after the end of the emergency. So if if the emergency were to continue, we'd have to deal with funding in fiscal 23. But for now. It's based on perhaps a hope that we will see the end of the emergency if everybody does what we need to do. And hopefully we see continue to see vaccinations and everything else. Hopefully we, um, we won't need to, hopefully this won't be extended beyond that. So that's my answer. Okay. Thanks. All right. Are there are further questions. The amendments were moved. Uh, Delegate Malone is waving his hand. Delegate Malone is on the floor. Luke, Luke, here's my one question, and I'm sorry I'm talking to somebody else about another bill coming up to get an opinion. Um, but you, you mentioned the money comes from the CARES Act, but if the money was, did, if the funds used from the CARES Act wasn't used for this bill, could they be used for something else? Or is it gotta be used for this or something very, very close to this? I'm going to, I'll, I'll read in the, um, in section three, um, it is the intention that, that subject to the availability of federal funds, the implementation, implementation of what I described um, will be uh, funded in fiscal 22 using, using federal funds. What if federal funds aren't available? We've Does it still have to happen? My, my understanding from talking to the chair of appropriations is the money, the money is there. We're spending money that, that is there. When I guess then it takes me back. Well, okay, well, what if, if if it wasn't used for this bill, could it be used for something else? I mean, I suppose. I mean, it, 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 if we pass this bill, could it be used for something else? No. Could it no. be something else if we didn't pass this bill? Sure. But it, okay. it, yeah, so this locks this money in. Okay, that's what I was looking for. Thank you. Okay. Any further questions? All right. Seeing none, uh, there's a motion on the amendments. All in favor of the amendments, please raise your hands. The vice chair, Lopez, Shetty, Moon, Jones, Williams, McComas, Watson, Malone. 
Davis, Crutchfield, Fisher, Bartlett, Carden, Eric Ann, Conaway, Griffith. I think that's everybody. Anybody opposed? Oh, I saw Champ. Uh, any, anybody opposed? Uh, grammar is opposed. All right, we're on the bill is amended. Um, is there further discussion? Move favorable. It's motion for a favorable. Yeah. Amendment. And a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none. All right, the vice chair? Yes. Delegate Eric Ann? No. Delegate Bartlett? Yes. Delegate Cardin? Yes. Delegate Conway? Yes. Delegate Cox? He's not here, that's right, he's excused. Delegate Crutchfield? Yes. Delegate Deborah Davis? Yes. Delegate Wanika Fisher? Yes, and thank you for the work on this. Delegate Grammer? No. Delegate Griffith? No. Delegate Rachel Jones? Yes. Delegate Lopez? Yes. Delegate Malone? No. Delegate McComas? No. Delegate Moon? Yes. Delegate Shetty? Yes. Delegate Cham? No. Delegate Watson? Yes. Delegate Williams? Yes. 13-6? 13-6. Thank you very much. Let me go now to wherever I put my list, my bill list, which is now gone. All right, we can go back to 71. Uh, and council? Yes. Has, has an answer for ways and needs. Yes, thank you. Thank you for your patience. The budget is not my area of expertise. So I was able to get what I hope Delegate Eric Han is the answer that you're looking for. So the funding hasn't changed by the Ways and Means Amendment. And the way it was explained to me is that even though the board, the bill created an independent board, the board is still within DJS, it's still part of the DJS budget. Um, when it comes, when the budget comes out, the unit would have its own separate amount code, but it's still under the DJS umbrella. And the role of the superintendent is really to carry out the directives of the board and what the board has already approved. So similar to how the state superintendent of schools answers to the state board of ed and carries out the directives of that board, that's how this superintendent is intended to operate. Okay, right, that, that does again. that does help. Thank you very much, Lauren. Sure. All right. Are there further questions? We were on the motion. I think we were adopting the amendment, right? We were adopting the amendment. That's correct. We adopted the adopting the amendment. So we'll just do that. All in favor of the amendments to House Bill 71, please raise your hands. The Vice Chair, Lopez, Shetty, Moon, Jones, Williams, McComas, Watson, Grammer, De Davis, Crutchfield, Conaway, Fisher, Bartlett, Cardin. Anyone opposed? Cham. All right. The, the amendments are adopted. Can I have a motion on the bill? Move the bill is amended. Motion for a favorable on the bill is seconded. Yeah. For further discussion, Delegate McComas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a, a real quick question, I guess for Lauren. Uh, my concern is the board is gonna select the superintendent. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, um, who, who presently is on the board? Uh, the reason I'm asking, not the, the names, but uh, their their qualifications. Like, do we have somebody that someone that's an a, an educator? Yes, yes. There's a, there is a board. So it's brand new. And okay. if you look at on page four, there is um, an educator member actually, and that that educator member has its you know its own. Um, provisions relating to the to the term of office and um, let's see sorry um, in the reprint I'm just trying to locate it it's on your reprint page four by amendment interlineated subsection B so you'll see on there all the all the um, provisions relating to that educator member 
And then what are the, um, I guess, um, I don't have it up. Wait a minute. Uh, that's something else. Uh, do, so what are the other qualifications for the other members? Uh, where I'm, where, Lauren, where I'm, sorry. Okay. Where I'm going with this is I want to make sure that we, whoever, the folks that are on the board that are going to deal with the superintendent, that uh, they have experience with um, uh, education programs for, for students that are, you know, not not living at home that are in a, they're, that are in a um, residential situation so that they have an appreciation for how to, how to keep the kids busy and happy and learning. That's, that's where I'm going with, you know. Okay. So the qualifications um, are in subset in that section nine 503 in your reprint subsection C and it has that the appointed members of the board shall possess a high level of knowledge and expertise in at least one of the following areas. Um, so there are about nine different areas. Digital learning is one of them, online, mental, behavioral health, working with institutionalized youth would probably be the one that you're thinking. Yeah. Okay. Um, services for individuals with disabilities, social work, prior service on the state board of ed, teaching or educational administration, higher ed administration, et cetera. Okay. All right, th thank you. Sure. Delegate, oh, we did that. Any further questions? Delegate Erican. I guess I'm still just confused why they why they struck department from everywhere and they put superintendent in. Like if it doesn't change how the how the money's being, who controls the financial part, what what is the point of that? What does that do? I mean, if you look at the purpose paragraph, they crossed up the department in like four places and replaced it with superintendent. What does that amendment do? I don't have the background because this all happened so late last night. We just got all these amendments and the staff is in a subcommittee meeting in Ways and Means. So I was able to reach out to other budget education experts. But let's, let's do this. Let's can't do this. Get to let's, the staff to let's, let's get this right. Um, Dylan, would you please be in contact with Delegate Lutke's office? And he's the person who's been the point person on Ways and Means. We would like to see if we can get him in on the voting session that we've got here so that he can explain it. Um, so we will hold on to that. We'll, we'll hold on to that because it's, a, it's an important question. We'll just hang on to it just for a second longer and hopefully we can catch them before they go into a voting session. Um, that's fine. So uh, we'll, we'll be right back with, uh, with that in a moment. We're gonna keep, keep going um, and gonna move some of the perhaps more straightforward stuff, but hey, it's us, so who knows? House Bill 1339, it extends the child support guidelines. There are no amendments. It is a fairly straightforward departmental bill. Move favorable. Is motion second. favorable? Is it second? All right. Any, any discussion about House Bill 1339? Seeing none, go to a roll call. The vice chair. A question. Yes. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. There is a question. I didn't see you raise your electronic hand, Delegate. I'll get, I'll get better at that. Um, uh, yeah, what? I mean, it's only been all session. I know. For you. Uh, but anyway, go ahead. Uh, Go ahead, Delegate Let me abstain because I do a lot of this work and I just want to be sure that it's not a problem with me voting on it because I have some action for this effect. Totally fine. Totally get that. Okay. Any, any further? This is House Bill 1339. Any further discussion? Seeing none. The Vice Chair? Yes. Delegate Erican? Yes. Delegate Bartlett? Yes. Delegate Cardin. Yes. Delegate Conaway. Yes. Delegate Cox is excused and I'm going to make notes. Delegate Crutchfield. Yes. Delegate Deborah Davis. Yes. Delegate Wanika Fisher. Yes. Delegate Robin Grammer. Yes. Delegate Griffith. Yes. Delegate Rachel Jones. Yes. Delegate Leslie Lopez. 
Delegate Malone. Abstained or excused, whichever is more appropriate. Excused. Um, Delegate McComas. Yes. Delegate Moon. Yes. Delegate Shetty. Yes. Delegate Cham. Yes. Delegate Watson. Yes. Delegate Williams. Yes. All right. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. Eighteen motion passes. Now joining us, fresh from the Ways and Means Committee, is Delegate Lutke to answer any questions we might have on House Bill 71 and what they did last night. All right, so uh, Delegate Arakan has a question and, and let's go ahead and Delegate Arakan, ask your question for Delegate Lutke and then he can he can answer that. Okay, thank you. I'm, I'm having all the questions on your bills, Delegate Lutke, lately. Hey, no, it's fine. I'm happy to answer them. <laughs> so I'm just looking at the, the changes that were made last night and it looks like it, um, in a lot of places, we've crossed out the department and we've inserted the superintendent. And I'm just wondering what effect does that have and why was it done? So I, I think the subcommittee intended it largely as a clarifying amendment. Um, what the model that, that we're pursuing here is similar to the model we use for the Maryland Center for School Safety, which is an independent unit of state government, but within the Maryland State Department of Education. And what that means is that you know, the, the governance of the, the agency itself, so in this case, the governance of the school system is under the control of the superintendent, right? But that they ride on the, you know, the fiscal services and the IT services and the HR services of the larger agency. Um, so, you know, what would happen here is, I mean, best practice would be that the, you know, when this board is, stands up and they appoint a superintendent, that superintendent and the Secretary of Juvenile Services, Secretary Abed, would negotiate a, a memorandum of understanding that would sort of walk through the, the, the sort of governance interaction there. But it's a model that's been successfully used elsewhere in state government. Okay. And is the MOU mentioned in here? Do we have that, that process laid out in here at all? It's not explicitly mentioned. I mean, I, I think, you know, I, I, I'm going to continue time actually meeting with Secretary Abed this afternoon and, and with some of the advocates, and I'm going to continue talking about potential clarifying amendments in, in the Senate once it gets across. Um, you know, there's we don't need to mandate an MOU. They can do it without it, but it, it might be best for us to add an amendment across the way that that says they should. Um, okay, okay. So this is still kind of fluid because so they they haven't they haven't weighed in on this exact amendment because this was passed super late last night, right? So we, we don't have feedback from them just yet on their opinion. Um, I, I think they're, uh, the, we've been talking to them. They're, the, so, it, my impression of where the department's at is they, they have a lot of questions right now about some of these changes, walking them through. I think they're not as familiar with the model of this independent unit within an agency, but you know, I think the department's position has been clear from the beginning that they, they, they want these reforms to the, the education system. And, and so I, I have no doubt that we'll get to a place where everyone's comfortable. The other thing to bear in mind is that the, the actual educational services don't transfer under this bill for a year and a half. Um, the, we, we intentionally did that to create time for the, this board and superintendent to stand up, to work through a lot of details. And I expect, you know, bluntly to the committee that we will have follow-up legislation next year clarifying some things as, as the agencies are, are standing up this new program. Okay, okay. So... Should we still be moving a version that's totally different than the Senate sides might be, or what? I mean, does does it help us to do that? Yeah, I mean, I think at this point, with the crossover deadline looming, it's best to get the the bill across. the The um, uh, JPR bill uh, is out on the floor now. I think it's on third reader in the Senate today. It doesn't include. I don't think it includes all the even the judiciary amendments, but. Um, but we're going to we're communicating with the sponsors and we're going to make sure that whatever final version passes, you know, is, is, is the final version. And frankly, OK, my plan is to defer to, to Senator Kelly and, and make sure that the final version is under her name because she's been working on this issue much longer than I have. And, and I think she. OK, she, so we may be headed for a conference committee situation where we're doing some tweaks is possibly is what I'm hearing. OK. OK, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Move the previous question again. Uh, does, I'm sorry, Delegate Moon, did you have another question? No, no, I'm moving the previous question again. Uh, all right, he's doing that again. Uh, 
just because we've got him here for another second, does anybody want to ask Delegate Luke any other questions? Anybody got any bills and ways and means? All right, never mind. All right, um, seeing uh, seeing none, we thank you very much and uh, move the previous question. All in favor of moving the previous, previous question, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. aye. We're moving the previous question, uh, which I believe was on the amendments. I No, we were on the bill. We were on the bill and there was a favorable with amendment. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none. The vice chair. Yes. Delegate Erican. Um, I'm. Uh, uh, I'm gonna vote no, and if I could explain why I'm voting no, um, this there's been so many changes to this. That I just don't understand really what the what the actual outcome is, and I feel uncomfortable now without hearing from the department and knowing what their opinion is on it. So I'm gonna have to be a no, but I may change my vote once I get some feedback from them. Thank you very much. Delegate Bartlett? Yes. Delegate Cardin? Yes. Delegate Conaway? Yes. Delegate Cox? Is, <laughs> I'll get it right one of these days. Delegate Crutchfield? Yes. Delegate Deborah Davis? Yes. Delegate Juanika Fisher? Yeah. Delegate Grammer? Yes. Delegate Griffith? Yes. Delegate Rachel Jones? Yes. Delegate Lopez? Yes. Delegate Malone? No. Delegate McComas? Yes. Delegate Moon? Yes. Delegate Shetty? Yes. Delegate Cham? Yes. Delegate Ron Watson? Yes. Delegate Nicole Williams. Yes. All right. Is he 17? Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's go. Let's mark that one. To House Bill 1008, I'm going to ask Delegate Williams. Uh, Delegate Williams had one of the bills that deals with uh, shielding or sealing of court records after an eviction filing. Uh, she can talk in greater detail. If somebody's got me on a reverb, are you? Okay, oh, that's better. All right, Delegate Williams, would you describe the Okay, somebody has their, are you, I don't, I'm getting a reverb. No, I mean, I'm. Are you unmuted? Oh, there we go. Now we're better. All right, let's try that again. Delegate Williams, there are amendments to House Bill 1008 um, that were worked out with MMHA and, um, and you and Delegate Hill and Delegate Henson. So if you'd go ahead, that'd be great. Yes, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so yes, as colleagues may remember, there were three similar bills that were filed as it relates to the shielding of eviction records um, for and failure to pay rent proceedings. Uh, the purpose kind of generally behind all of these bills was really to assist um, as we heard throughout this session, um, testimony about the concern with landlords uh, utilizing the failure to pay rent process um, as a tool, as really a collect, more of a collection tool, as opposed to dealing with situations where um, individuals really were um, behind in the rent and being egregious and uh, those types of things. So what this bill does, it basically will, in the case where a uh, failure to pay rent can but then was later dismissed um, after 60 days. And that's one of the amendments in the bill. Originally, the bill stated after 30 days, uh, if the case was ruled in favor of the tenant, then the court uh, would automatically shield the record. Um, that's been now extended to 60 days uh, based on the um, compromise that we worked out with the uh, Maryland Multi-Housing uh, 
Immigration Association, as well as the judiciary, um, after 60 days and after all appeals have been exhausted, um, then the court would shield the record in those situations. If it is a failure to pay, pay rent case, um, and Dylan, I don't know if you can scroll down to the language where um, the judgment was entered in favor of the landlord. I mean, this is pretty much similar to existing law. The tenant can petition the court to shield the record um, and the court, obviously, after an evidentiary hearing upon finding uh, that justice was served can shield the record. I'm just trying to remember the time frame on that second part here. Um, and that can occur um, after 12 months has passed after the final resolution of the proceeding in those types of situations. Um, additionally, the district court may not seal court records under this subsection if the tenant receives federal funds to subsidize the rent um, that is required under a lease agreement. And as additionally, even when records are shielded uh, upon written request of the tenant or the order of the court um, upon a showing of compelling need, uh, they can um, uh, obtain a copy of the order um, or uh, shield. Uh, the tenant can later on obtain a copy of the order under this section from the clerk. Um, you know, upon going to the courthouse and doing so, um, as well as um, the court, as well as on a showing of compelling need as well. So anyway, those are the amendments in a nutshell. Uh, like I said, they have been worked out amongst most of the stakeholders. Everybody is happy with the amendments and I think it will still achieve its purpose um, as was originally filed. I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, no, move the amendment. The motion on the amendments, is there a second? Second. And a second. All in favor, uh, well, let's go to discussion. Any discussion on the amendments? Seeing Delegate Erickson. Just to confirm, there's nobody in opposition to this bill now? Not that I'm not aware of. Like I said, we did uh, work with Maryland Multi Housing. Aaron Greenfield signed off on the amendments as well as the judiciary because the judiciary's concern was the 30 days and now with the language that says 60 days. And after all appeals have been exhausted, uh, we believe that they're fine with the provisions in the bill now. Okay. okay. And the purpose is just so that if people are innocent, other landlords won't use this won't we'll use this information against, against them. them. And as, as we all know, these records are public records. They can show up on the Maryland case judiciary site. Um, and so it could impact a tenant when they're trying to seek um, at another location, or even if they wish to move from being a tenant to being a homeowner. Um, a lot of times when you're trying to get a mortgage loan, they like to see your rental history as well. And so this will hopefully help individuals who are trying to transition to becoming homeowners to be able to easily do that. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're muted, Mr. Chair. Is that important? Um, Delegate McComas, then Delegate uh, Malone. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Delegate Williams, question for you. Has any other states tried this and there's been a record that it works well? Uh, and and so, for how yes, long? Yes, there was actually, um, I know off the top of my head, uh, the bill that I had put forth was actually mirrored after a legislation that passed in Colorado. Um, I would say kind of mid uh, last year. So I know Colorado has similar legislation. I'm not aware of any negative impacts um, of that legislation since it's been enacted in the state of Colorado. Um, but I, and I think there may be a couple other states as well. I just have to, but that's the one that kind of pops up off the top of my head. Delegate Malone. Delegate Williams, I, I like this bill. I like this concept. Here, here's my concern. It's been no secret. I've not been thrilled by the landlord uh, tenant bills. And my worry is, you know, we've put in a lot of restrictions on what landlords can do. And to me, it's going to be even more important for landlords to be have a greater confidence level that they're getting a great pay tenant or as close to they can't they can get to a great pay tenant. And I'm, I'm just a little hesitant because of that. So I may very well vote not, no, and I'll think about it more between now and my floor vote, but I think I may be no now, but I wanna commend you because I, 
certainly I really like the idea. To me, it's kind of like almost like a you know PBJ or a STET in the criminal context that grew up once and you know a way it doesn't penalize you forever. Um, right. And feel free to use that PBJ or STET argument if. Well, thank you, Delegate Malone. I appreciate that. And that's why for cases where the judgment has been entered in favor of the landlord, those records will not be shielded. And like I said, the tenant would not be able to petition the court until after 12 years after that judgment has been finalized against that tenant. And then again, the court would have to find that there was a compelling reason for that record to be shielded in those situations. So that record um, will still be out there if the, like I said, if the judgment was entered in favor of the landlord and the failure to pay rent cases. So that way, hopefully future landlords, like you said, will have a good snapshot um, of one's uh, rental history. Yeah. And, and I commend you for reaching out to Aaron Greenfield. I've, I've found him a helpful source with these cases. Yes. Thank you. Delegate Conaway. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Delegate Williams, did you say 12 years? I'm sorry, 12 months, 12 months, sorry. Oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> I, mean, right. I was like, what? <laughs> so, hey, thank yeah, 12 you. years is a long time, 12 months. I don't long even think time. it stays in your credit report for 12 bill. years. Right. <laughs> yes, Move the previous question. Seven years well, for credit. Motion for the previous question. Um, all in favor of the previous question say aye. 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 No, motion carries. We're on the amendments. For the amendments, please raise your hands. Atterbury, Griffith, Lopez, Shetty, Moon, Cham, Jones, William, McComas, Watson, Malone, Grammer, Davis, Fisher, Conaway, Bartlett, Carden, and Erica Ann is not raising her hand. Are you raising your hand? Okay. Anybody opposed? Uh, Crutchfield also with the yes. Nobody opposed. So the amendments are adopted. We're on the bill is favorable. House bill 1008. There's a motion for favorable. Is there a second? Second. All right. Discussion, Delegate Griffith. Griffith. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> no, I was a yes. And 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 Delegate Malone brought up a, a interesting point. You know, this bill was something certainly very necessary uh, as we were taking up heading into session but we passed a number of pieces of legislation that certainly discourage uh, uh, frivolous, uh, you know, people just taking people to court just for, as a clearing house and, you know, all the, I'm not gonna unpack all the other bills. So, I mean, I think we're gonna see folks less inclined just take people just to use the state as a collections agency. Um, and those things certainly were popping up on, um, you know, this bill was covering a lot of that. So that's a really interesting point that I'm really trying to, 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 to sort out in my head on the fact that we are likely to see less, maybe significantly less um, frivolous matters brought to the courts. And the, the remainder are going to be more legitimate than the previous ones. Uh, and, and so and here's a question, and, and thanks for bearing with me as I'm sorting through my question in my head. So if, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not a landlord or anything, but say, you know, say I have a property and I have somebody three months behind in rent and I file a motion in court to get that collected and they pay, and it gets tossed because they pay, would that be shielded in this? To answer your question, uh, Delegate Griffith, after 60 days and there has been no, and all appeal rights have been exhausted, then yes. So even though they were legitimately three months late and I filed and got it reconciled, and that individual has been established as somebody who paid late, and so what if that happened a second time? Well, if they pay, so if they paid after the judgment was entered in your favor and the landlord's favor, then no. Um, but if the case was dismissed prior to the entry of a judgment, then yes. So if they paid before the judge ruled and the judge tossed because they settled up, then that would still be, and if that happened 
So then two more, then they paid two months in a row, and then you hit uh, uh, three more months of not pay. You take them to court. They pay right before judgment. It gets tossed again, and it gets in that cycle. All that would be shielded potentially. And with that one question, honest question, is that how? Is that a scenario that would happen? Because I don't know if that's the case. And two, if that is a scenario that is possible or, you know, happens occasionally, would all that be shielded? It happens occasionally, uh, Delegate Griffith, but eventually, I mean, if they're chronic and they're late payments, at some point, they're not going to be able to pay. Um, and then you would have a judgment against them and that wouldn't automatically be shielded once you have that judgment against them for the failure to pay rent. But let's say this person's my tenant for two years and we have this continual cycle and they're able to you know, pay up right before each and every time. And then after two years, I decide not to renew my lease with them. The next landlord wouldn't know they've had this continual cycle of three months ago, three months ago, three months ago. And so the next, you know, so. I, right, but the landlord would also have other tools to kind of determine whether or not they are, uh, you know, again, they can search their credit record, their credit reports. They can also, you know, get references. So they could reach out to you landlord um, as part of their references and you could provide to the new potential landlord kind of your experience with that potential um, with that previous tenant of yours. Um, so I think there are other tools and mechanisms that a, a potentially new landlord could utilize to still find out that same information, Delegate Griffith. Yeah, I mean, I know what we're trying to do here and I, and I agree with what we're trying to do here. I'm just thinking through this now concerned about some of the unintended consequences. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Delegate Eric can. Thanks. So yeah, okay, Delegate Griffith just raised a bunch of issues. So yeah, I think this is gonna be really unfair then to, to landlords because if somebody's repeatedly doing what he's described, people should be able to know about that. that, that and there's maybe a way we could amend it so that, you know, if, if they've had, um, you know, landlords file against them more than once or more than twice, there could be a way to address this concern. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And like I said, it will still show on the credit report. So you still have that at your disposal, uh, Delegate Eric Ann. But that's only if the landlord that had them before filed, like I've never filed anything on my tenants. Right, so, well, if you've never filed, then this law wouldn't even come into play. No, I mean, never filed anything against their credit report. So that's two different well, things. Well, actually, when you file something with the district court, it actually will automatically show up on a credit report. So, oh, really? Yeah, it's Absolutely. not. Yeah, there's a section on credit reports called judgments and called court cases. And even if the case is dismissed, it's still going to show on that individual's credit report. So it will still hmm. be. So then what does this, so this bill doesn't actually shield any, anything then? Well, it would shield the case from like the Maryland court, the judiciary system and those types of things. Good point. Well, I, I, just don't, I just don't know. You have to wait for your turn now, Delegate Moon. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just don't think reports all the time. So I always, yeah, I just don't know now cases even show up there. Unfortunately. Okay. So that's, a, that's a separate conversation that we can have at a later date about whether that should happen or not. But anyway. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So now I, I understand that's better what, it, but now I think that the bill doesn't actually do what it's supposed to do. So I'm probably still going to vote against it. Well, now. it would be helpful if you do a Google search, it's not going to show up on an online search or anything along those lines. Yeah, but yeah, so if I pull their credit, though, it will show up there, so, okay. But you're pulling right. their credit as a potential new landlord. Right, right. Which they're consenting to because they're checking the box and probably paying a $25 credit reporting fee to you as part of their rental application. Right, right, yeah, okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right, are there further questions? Seeing, uh, I think Delegate Griffith asked this question before, he just left his hand up. Yeah. I was just gonna say, uh, Delegate Williams, uh, if you just uh, mentioned 
to begin with that the uh, filing would have still filed on the credit report, I wouldn't have been through this torture. For it's okay. I'm sorry. I, it, it, I, 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 I'm i just finished my coffee for the morning. I'm not fully awake yet. So. <laughs> all right. So now that we've established it's all Delegate Williams' fault, we'll go on. there's a motion for a favorable, and I believe there was a second. I don't see further uh, requests for discussion, so we'll go to the roll call. The vice chair. Um, I want to start off by saying I want to thank Delegate Williams for all her work on this bill. I can tell she put a lot uh, into it. And I also want to say it's incredibly selfless of you uh, to not have your name on it. You're obviously more focused on the policy. I wish your name was on it. Um, but you obviously put a lot into it. So thank you. Uh, I think it's a great bill. And I'm a yes. All right. Delegate Eric Han. No. Delegate Bartlett. Hold on one second. Yes. Are you telling us to hold on? Delegate Cardin. I'm going to follow the uh, the vice chair's lead again, hopefully not get in trouble, but say yes. <sighs> Delegate Conaway. Yes, I'm going to follow the vice chair's lead because Delegate Eric Con was only wants the bucks. Yes. <laughs> Delegate Crutchfield. <laughs> Yes. Delegate Deborah Davis. Yes. Delegate Juanika Fisher. Yes. Delegate Grammer. No. Delegate Griffith. Yes. Delegate Rachel Jones. Yes. Delegate Lopez. Yes. Delegate Malone. A very soft no. And once again, to explain my vote, yeah, I have to take this into account in the total package of bills passed and, and the total package of bills passed at this point causes me to be a no. Delegate McComas. Um, a reluctant no, because I'm very impressed with what uh, Delegate Williams did and, and I can see that she's really did a lot of good work. So, but it, it's a no. Delegate Moon. Yes. Shetty. Yes. Cham. Yes, and may I explain my vote? Go ahead. I've been laid on my rent a few times in my 20s, and I uh, didn't have the grace <laughs> extended to me. So there are many people who are going through right now, um, and sometimes I need a little grace. They're trying their best. Um, some of the bills I voted against because um, I felt like they were just too far reaching. But this one I think is... Um, is a helpful uh, extension of a helping hand for, for tenants to get it together. So I'm a yes on this. Delegate Ron Watson. Well, if Jam's a yes, I have to be a yes. <laughs> Delegate Williams. Um, I'm a yes, and I just wanted to say one thank you to my colleagues. Um, for me, this is more about the, getting the policy passed than the glory of the bill. Um, I found it a really important issue. Uh, and so I just want to thank everybody. Um, and even those who voted against, thank you as well. Thank you all very much. That concludes that, that bill. I see this bill in my future that I didn't think I'd see on a voting list, but it's still a couple folders down. Let's can see. We get the, can we get the number? Can we get the numbers on the vote? Starts with an eight. I don't no, know. can we get the number? A lot of people ask vote? me about it. A lot of people ask me about it. Can we get the number on the last vote to count? Uh, the four, was that 15? 15. 15, 15, four. Hear about this bill. What's going on? I don't know. It starts to, with I'm about eight. to use my hold. <laughs> <laughs> You're keeping us in anticipation. Come on now. Uh, it's a couple folders down here. Let's see. Well, favorable. It's is couple folders down. No, 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 no. We're going to House Bill 719 now. Oh, oh I'm not using my hold. Not using my hold. I'm not using my hold. Okay, I got some holds then, Moon. <laughs> hey, I, 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 I was about to say, like, we only have a few days left. I got a hold still. <laughs> Oh boy! It's you better use it now because you know those holds aren't good on on the day of crossover. If you all want right. to be here all day voting on Saturday, hold away. Wait, is that true? We don't get holds on crossover. Seven nineteen, House Bill seven nineteen, please. Delegate Moon has been working on this bill. There are amendments to this bill. 
Uh, Delegate Moon, can you describe the changes that you made to the bill? It, so this was the bill about um, when a commercial tenant has signed a lease during, has a lease during the COVID emergency, was forced to close, and they have a personal guarantee clause in their lease that would allow the, the commercial landlord to um, seize their house and things like this, their personal assets. Um, so the bill came in and it said, yeah, we're not going to, we're not going to allow this during the COVID emergency. And I know there was sympathy to that position, but um, some worry, what if the, the commercial landlord is themselves um, just another small person, a normal person. So the bill change the amendments change the shall to a may. And they basically give the judge the opportunity to void out the personal liability clause. And I didn't want to leave it standard list. So it says if the totality of circumstances would make this unjust. And so the, this, at least one of the scenarios I'm contemplating is the one that came to the hearing where the tenant um, had, was seven years into a 10 year lease, had always been paying. The landlords had made back their build out costs in the first year. They were out of state, um, Colorado based real estate investment trust. Um, and were not being responsive to the tenant who was working in good faith and sending payments to work out a um, plan. So again, uh, it's just an option under this bill and it would only be during the COVID emergency and only if the judge found that doing this would be unjust. Um, so that's, that's it. And this was upheld in New York without it being an option. They said in New York, we're just canceling these clauses and that survived court challenge. So this is far, far softer. All right. Um, I know that uh, um, I, I th we did outreach to, to people who might be concerned um, from the commercial landlord side of this. They, they wanted to make sure that this was only in place during the catastrophic health emergency. That's, that's in the bill. Um, and the fact that it's a may as opposed to a shall, I think, was important to them as well. With that all, all having been said, um, Delegate Eric and then Fisher. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Great, great work on this, Delegate Moon. OK, so now we had only two unfavorables on looking at the system. Um, have, have those two groups reached out to you? It was the Realtors and BOMA. Uh, I have not heard that they have changed their position on this. Um, I will tell you, just so you're aware, um, there were many, many more groups that took a look at this. Um, restaurant Association, Retailers Association, and it's just, you know, nobody, I think everybody wanted to do something. The way the bill came in, it was very aggressive. Um, I think this is about as, as close you'll get to people to saying, well, let's give this a go. I think people realize that there is an unfairness um, that's going to happen here. And I actually think um, some chunk of the commercial landlords don't plan on being jerks and doing this to their tenants. But um, I'm already hearing of the odd case here and there um, where, where the landlords are trying to exercise and put liens on people's houses. Um, so uh, I think this is a pretty fair compromise. Yeah, I, I, I think you did a, a lot of good work on this. Um, the only thing I would say is I, I because because the state is really the cause of this, I, I almost think that the state should be on the hook for it. But uh, I guess this is uh, the next the next best thing. Um, so thanks for your work on this. I'll I'll be a yes. Delegate uh, Wanika Fisher, then Conaway. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to thank Delegate Moon for his incredible hard work on this and that I would encourage everyone to vote yes. I, I, they're with the shall and in, in here's, um, with the, I mean, the may versus the shall, I don't even think it goes far enough as to what some of our small businesses actually need. I wish it even went further, but I'm very um, thankful to Delegate Moon um, for, for this work. And I've had many, um, I've had several businesses in my district face these consequences um, and issues. So thank you so much, Delegate Moon. Delegate Conaway, then Carl. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Delegate Moon. I'm for, I'm for the bill, but I do have a problem if 
you put up your personal assets, let's say you have a million dollars and someone gives you a shot at a business. I mean, if something happens, you, you know that things can happen. It could be a tsunami, it could be a hurricane, anything, but you, you want your shot at, at your business. So on looking at it from that perspective, I think that you commercial side, they did should have to. Have an issue. Okay. What? Oh, from, from right, somebody broke in. Oh. I think that you should have to pay and that you and that you would be liable. But I am for the bill, so I just wanted to say that. And, and just to clarify, Delegate Conway, I, I think you would be liable in that scenario. I mean, the, the sort of unjust requirement was meant to exclude if it was Dan Snyder, you know, saying my FedEx fortune, I'm staking my personal word that I'll pay the lease at FedEx field, that he would be made to do that um, because it would not be unjust to make him pay. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Delegate Cardin. Thank you. Just a real quick question. Um, have, has there been any court challenges that have succeeded um, yet that we are aware of where the judge has ruled that you can't, um, can't waive a, a contractual obligation? I haven't seen it. The New York case is the most on point because it was to a very, very similar bill. I've also seen successful challenges to um, lease clauses during COVID um, without the existence of a bill. And, you know, we have UCC provisions and other, um, you know, unconscionability of clauses that you could point to. Um, but I would say courts have even been doing this without laws. So um, this just, if anything, it just puts a standard in, in for how you would do it. Further questions? We're on now the amendment. Is there a motion for the amendment? Move the amendment. Move the second. amendment is there and there is a second. All in favor of the amendment, we've had discussion. Can we go to the, yeah, there we go. Please raise your hands if you're for the amendment. Vice Chair Griffith, Shetty, uh, Moon, Cham, Jones, Williams, McComas, Watson, Malone, Grammer, Davis, Crutchfield, Gonaway, Fisher, Bartlett, Cardin, Arakan. Anyone opposed? Oh, I. Uh, Lopez was a yes. Lopez's hand was off the camera. I missed her. All right. I didn't see anybody opposed. So the amendments adopted. We're on the bill as amended. Is there a motion on the bill as amended? Move the bill as amended. Favorable as amended. Uh, and there's a second. Any further discussion? None. The vice chair? Yes. Eric Han? Yes. And just to explain my vote again, uh, I still think that the governor and the government should be paying for a lot of this damage because they're who caused it. But uh, but this is the next best thing, I think. Okay, Bartlett? Yes. Cardin? Yes. Conaway? Yes. Crutchfield? Yes. Deborah Davis? Yes. Wanika Fisher? Yes. Grammer? Yes. Griffith? Yes. Rachel Jones? Yes. Lopez? Yes. Malone? Mike? Malone? Soft no. Think, had to think about it. Soft no. McComas? Yes. Moon? Yes. Shetty? Yes. Cham? Yes. Watson? Yes. Williams? Yes. Mr. Okay. Chair, in light, in light of Delegate Malone's, can I make mine a hard yes? 18 to 1. This, Thanks, guys. This bill after this next one, it has it has two eights that start. HB 8, 8 something. Come on. House Bill 1248, Delegate Washington. House Bill 1248 and Delegate Washington. Um. There is an amendment. Uh, Claire, could you talk about what the amendment does, please? Claire? Sorry, I have trouble unmuting sometimes. Um, these are just technical amendments. They just um, change the law enforcement officer because the one that was used 
introduced in the bill as introduced is referring to the LEOBR, which is being repealed. So it just um, it's the reference to law enforcement officer and police officer to the definitions that are in the subtitle for the Maryland Police Training and Standards Commission. So just technical. All right. So what the bill does is it requires reporting to the governor's Office of Crime Prevention, Youth and Victim Services uh, information for the previous calendar year on each incident involving a law enforcement officer employed by a law enforcement agency that resulted in a monetary settlement or judgment against the law enforcement agency. And it provides uh, information regarding the person who was involved in the incident, the law enforcement officer, uh, including their age, gender, ethnicity, and race, a description of what happened at the incident, the date, time, and location of the incident, the date on which the civil action was filed, the date on which the civil action was re resolved, and the amount of the settlement. So it provides that information with regard to settlements in cases where uh, police officers, uh, where, where local jurisdictions have paid out settlements for police officers who act uh, with uh, misconduct. Delegate Eric Han with uh, a question. Well, well, let's do this. The, the amendment. Move the amendment. One. I'm, I'll move the amendment. Um, second. Amendment is uh, moved and seconded. We'll just do a voice vote here. Well, we'll just. All in favor of the amendment is a technical amendment. Please raise your hands. Delegates Eric Han Atterbury, Lopez Griffith, Cham Jones, Williams, McComas, Shetty, Moon, Watson, Malone, Grammer, Davis, Conaway, Fisher, Bartlett, Carden, and Crutchfield. Anybody opposed? I think that's everybody on board. Okay, so now we're on the bill as amended. Can we have a motion on the bill as amended? Move the bill. Is motion for a favorable on? Uh, Mr. Chair, I have an amendment. Do you? Do we have a, car, a grammar amendment? I do not see it. I'm trying to find when I sent it. All right. While you do that, we will take a question from Delegate Eric Han. And you, you see when you sent it, uh, Dylan's looking too. Delegate Eric Han. Thanks, Mr. Chair. So um, I could have sworn that we had something really similar in 670. Is there not already reporting requirements for exactly this type of situation in 670 that's encompassed in 670? I don't believe so. No, no. I'm sorry, Claire, go ahead. There's no reporting in 670 for monetary settlements. That's what this is. Uh, okay, so that's just use of force incidences and things like that, um, but not not with Correct. the actual money part. Correct. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Delegate like Grammer, have you been successful? No, I didn't send it to the committee. All right. Can I get a second? A second for the motion. I think we have a second for the motion. It was for the favorable. Um, so we're anyway. on the bill, Delegate Conway is raising his hand. Since, since Delegate Grandma uh, can't find his amendment, are we allowed to use the hold to hold for him to look for his amendment? I'll he, he didn't. I send mean, it I, I could I could share my screen, but I, since I forgot to send it to the committee, I'm not going to make a big deal out of it. Okay. Oh, okay. Thank you. All right. I appreciate you looking out, Delegate Conway. That's fine. Okay, there's a bill. Uh, there was a motion for a favorable, and there are amendments. There are further discussion. Seeing none. The vice chair. Yes. Eric Can. Yes. Bartlett. Yes. Harden. Yes. Conaway? Yes. Crutchfield? Yes. Deborah Davis? Yes. Juanika Fisher? All right. Um, yes. Grammer? Yes. Griffith? Yes. Rachel Jones? Rachel Jones? We lose her. Oh, she's not at her. We'll 
Come back to her. Lopez? Yes. Malone? Yes. McComas? Yes. Moon? Yes. Shetty? Yes. Sham? Yes. Watson? Yes. Williams? Yes. Delegate Rachel Jones had to step away. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. Oh, so many members of the committee bothering me about this bill. Co conspirators all. Isn't it true that the squeaky wheel gets the grease? I don't know. Can I sit here for 22 minutes? The Court of Appeals originated in the 17th century. Oh, here we go. According to the archives of the great state of Maryland. <laughs> During the early years of the settlement of Maryland, the court of the General Assembly sat as a court of law as well as the legislature. When the assembly divided into two houses in 1650, the upper house or governor and council became the court of appeals. During the revolution, the court of appeals was reformed by the Maryland constitution of 1776. Judges were appointed by the governor with the advice and consent of the council. The court sat here in Annapolis. By 1805, the chief judges of the six judicial districts of the state constituted the Court of Appeals. 1805 to 1851, the courts added Easton and the Eastern Shore, which I actually didn't know, as well as at Annapolis. They held their commissions on good behavior, but could be removed by the governor. House Bill 885. Move favorable. Second. second. Motion for a favorable and a second. <sighs> Fine. Are there questions? Delegate Card. Do you consider Delegate Watson like the Court of Intermediate Appeals? So there's no question. It's just Circuit Court, Court of Intermediate Appeals, Court of Appeals, or Court of Final Appeals. No, I did not, my friend. And, and the reason I, I ask that, I know that I know where the courts have come down on this, but I think that there is a question of confusion with Supreme Court because there is only one Supreme Court in the United States, number one. Number two is, why should we want to be like New York versus Maryland, which is actually was established before New York as a state, has a better history, has better horse racing, has maybe not better bagels, but has much better crabs, I would think we would want to be our own Court of Intermediate Appeals and Court of Final Appeals. And I would, I, I would ask us to suggest that amendment, but I, whatever it is, it is. I've already voted for Robin's amendment, so I'm going to vote for whatever. I, I appreciate how much the uh, chair has paid you to say that, uh, Delegate Cardin, but I, I just find it odd that 49 other states would be incorrect and the way they're doing things. Oh, I think that's a perfectly, I've seen that happen all the time. <laughs> I understand. If the state of Ohio the told you to jump off a bridge. Reject that amendment and uh, move forward on the bill. State of Ohio told you to jump off a bridge, would you do it? Delegate Griffith, then McComas. So Griffith. what's the what's the federal equivalent to the Court of Appeals again? Shut up, Delegate McComas. It was my understanding that an esteemed committee chairman took a walk and said it's the Court of Appeals. And, um, you know, we're going to bankrupt the state of Maryland by having to change it to some other, the Supreme Court of Maryland. And I, I have real problems with this bill because uh, we, you know, this is just throwing good money after bad. That's all I'll say. Love you all so much. Delegate Juanika Fisher. I, I want to say to the, the delegate who's sponsoring this bill, this has definitely been, you, you, you're a great sponsor. 
you're a great sponsor for this bill. I would I would want to ex I want would want to say um, the judiciary was in favor of this legislation, and I hope on Delegate McComas's comments that the money to change to do whatever changes that they will also be open to the things that this committee asked them to do monetarily on other things. And I wanted that just to be on record, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Delegate Conaway. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So is Delegate McComas correct that this name change will be the Supreme Court of Maryland? That's what the bill says. How wonderful, thank you. <sighs> Are there further comments on this bill? Delegate Williams, you're on mute. Since everyone else is commenting, um, I just want to thank the sponsor. Um, all future law school students here in the state of Maryland will really appreciate uh, your hard work on this and not being utterly confused <laughs> moving forward. And so, uh, yes, thank you to my colleague from the 23rd. <laughs> now I'm going to say it. Move the previous question. Move the previous question. Um, all in favor of moving the previous question, say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. We're on the previous question, which is the bill. Straight favorable. Who favorable? Yeah. Second. Okay, second. Great. All right. The vice chair. I have been an attorney in 21 years, and I've always thought this was the most ridiculous thing ever. So I appreciate the bill, Delegate Watson, and that is a very strong yes. Delegate Erican? Yes. Delegate Bartlett? Yes. Delegate Cardin? My, my sound's not working here, sorry. Um, okay, sure. Whatever. Is that a yes or what, what was the vote? Sure, whatever. It's a sure whatever. Delegate Conaway? Yes. Delegate Crutchfield. Thank you, Delegate Watson, for bringing this bill. And yes, definitely. Delegate Deborah Davis. Delegate Watson, I appreciate your tenacity. It's a yes. Delegate Juanika Fisher. For my brother from Prince George's County, the only reason I'm with this bill, because it's my brother from Prince George's County, I'm a yes. Delegate Grammer. Yes, sir. Delegate Griffith. Yes. Delegate Rachel Jones. Yes. Delegate Lopez. Yes, though Delegate. I would have preferred it be the Thurgood Marshall Supreme Court and just do a full uh, 360. It did have an amendment to call it Crazy Ron's House of Justice. Delegate Malone. And I'd never figured this would be a tough vote, but it is partly because I'm afraid by voting no that Ron's not going to wave at me when he's driving down Route 3 on his way back home from somewhere north of Route 3. But I am a soft no. Delegate McComas. Um, because Ron is such a, a, a good, easygoing guy, I'm going to vote yes. Delegate Moon. Yes, duh. This has confused me since law school. Del if it did confuse you. Delegate Shetty. Yes. Delegate Cham. Yes. Delegate Williams. Yes. For his first bill out of the Judiciary Committee, Delegate Ron Watson. My second bill, <laughs> yes. <laughs> And thank you colleagues for the support. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I know it was tough, but I appreciate you. And Malone, I'll still wave at you. Our long national nightmare is over. House Bill 882, 
Uh, we have some time here. There are three bills coming up. Each one of them are um, each one of them are task forces. So we're going to do these three. Uh, it's 882, 1250, and, eight, and 681. We'll take, the, take them each up individually. House Bill 882 is an extension. Um, we we um, overrode the governor's veto on the shielding bill in um, uh, earlier this year. Part of the shielding bill was a work group to study partial expungement, but it expired by the time we got to override the veto. So this bill would revive that and would uh, and um, would allow that work group to go forward. There are amendments uh, that conform this bill to the Senate uh, to the Senate version of the bill. So there's conforming language. We'll go to Delegate Conway first, then Delegate Grammer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Committee. I talked to Ms. Jennifer Beskett from the. Department of Public Safety and Correctional Services this morning. And she, according to her, they would like to be included in this bill. Have you received anything on that? So the issue here was that um, I think that the Department of Public Safety wants to be included for the purposes of CGIS. The sponsor asked to conform it to the Senate bill to keep the bill moving and just to get the work group set up. Okay, at least, at, least I, at least I expressed it. Thank you very much. Delegate Grammer. Hey, I just, thanks, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to follow up on that point. So uh, if you remember when we were talking about the different agencies and their participation in the potential expungement process, uh, the Department of Public Safety and Correctional Services informed us that you know, when the courts rule to, to expunge something, the criminal justice information system, which is within the Department of Public Safety and Correctional Services, is the, the agency which is going to be processing most of this. And that's why they had asked. So if you remember when talking about this, it wasn't a simple process. They're going to be doing most of the work. And that's I, I hate to force the issue with the committee, but that's for your consideration. That's why they had asked to be part of this. Okay, um, so the amendments again conform to the Senate version of the bill that does leave DPSCS off. Um, the, can I have a motion on the amendments? So moved. Motion for the amendments, is there a second? second? I think I heard a second. So second. We're on the amendments. Um, any further discussion? Seeing none. All in favor of the amendments, please raise your hands. Grammar, Atterbury, Lopez. Jones, Williams, McComas, Shetty, Moon, Watson, Malone, Davis, Fisher, Conaway, Carden. Um, anybody opposed? Seeing none, the amendments are adopted. Mr. Chair, would it be appropriate to move to include them just to say that we considered it and I fought like a tiger? All right. Let's do this. The bells are ringing. To the sponsor one more time about this. We're gonna. I'd, I'd like to do that. We are gonna come back for a voting session immediately after. Uh, uh, yeah, we'll we will come back for a voting session one hour after the um, the voting session or the uh, floor session. So you'll have time to go and eat after this floor session, which may be significant. So with that we'll 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 just hold it right here and then go from there. All right, it's 11.51, the bells have rung to go to the floor. We will come back at um, whenever that is, probably my guess between five maybe th this evening.